that the soul and the spirit are so closely unified. They are so almost synonymous with one another that it's just almost impossible to divide the two. It's almost impossible to, to separate the two. There's only one thing with the power to do that, and that's God's Word. Only God's Word has that surgical precision uh, to be able to uh, divide those things. So this just gives us a clue about the difficulty of trying to actually divide the soul and spirit and think about these things as, as two separate kind of entities. However, when you survey the Bible, uh, there, there do seem to be some, some differences. So the word soul is nephesh in Old Testament Hebrew, and it's suke. It uh, looks like psyche for us, uh, but it's suke is the pronunciation in New Testament Greek. And you can see what a huge, massive study this is because the word nephesh is used 757 times in the Old Testament. Suke is used 102 times uh, in, in the New Testament. Here are some of the basic ways that it's used. First of all, the core of our being where our emotions and our desires and our longings originate. Few different examples. You know, this is kind of like the heart. The heart is kind of talked about it in similar terms, but this is even maybe even deeper than the heart is the soul. Okay, so a few examples. Genesis 34, 8, Hamor spoke with him saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Good pickup line. You know, my soul longs to go on a date with you, right? Uh, might be a little strong. Uh, Deuteronomy 4, 29, uh, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and with all your soul, right? And we have the, obviously, love your God with all your heart and all your soul and your, your mind and strength. So it's just like the very depth of your being, the, the emotions, uh, the feelings, the desires, the longings, okay? The second way that it's used is to talk about, oh, whoops, I forgot I had this example up here. Uh, in the New Testament, Jesus said to them, my soul is deeply grieved. To the point of death, remain here and keep watch with me. Uh, now, the third way that, or excuse me, the second way this uses our entire being, including our bodies. <clears throat> there we go. Didn't want to click too many times there. This one's a little odd for us because we've been so heavily influenced by Greek philosophical soul body dualism that when we in America hear the word soul our almost our immediate and only conception of the soul is that part of us which is separate from our bodies but the word nephesh um, or, or soul in, in the Old Testament actually can be used to talk about our entire self, our whole being, including our bodies. In fact, the, the second major, most common way nephesh is translated in the Old Testament is, is life, our entire life. So here's a good example. Genesis 2, 7, then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, a living nephesh. Okay, now, that's a weird thing for us to say, right? Man became a living soul because we don't, we don't think of ourselves as walking around as living souls because when we think that, we think of Ghostbuster. We think, oh, that means we're ghosts, you know, walking around. But no, it's, it's the whole being, the whole person, including the body. Uh, Genesis 37, I meant to underline this here, but Reuben heard this. He rescued Joseph out of their hands and he said to his brothers, let us not take his soul. Let us not kill Joseph. Don't Life is the word nephesh there. Numbers 31, 19. And you camp outside the camp seven days. Whoever has killed any soul and whoever has touched any slain, purify yourselves, uh, you and your captain on the third day and the seventh day. Uh, so, again, it, you can't. It's not like, okay, if you kill someone's soul, he's talking about the immaterial part of ourselves outside of our bodies because they can't kill that part. Okay, he's talking about the person. That's why it's translated person uh, a lot of times in, in the Old Testament as well. Even in the New Testament where we just studied in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus, he says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your 
your life, your, your soul, your suke, as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you'll put on, is not your suke, is not your soul more than food and the body uh, more, than, more than clothing. So that's very interesting, it's our entire being, including our bodies. Uh, and then the third main way is uh, the inner immaterial part that's separate from our bodies and unaffected by death. Now, this is our most common view of the soul, probably because uh, of the way that the New Testament speaks of it. Uh, it. It is the way the most the New Testament most often describes it, but it's harder to find verses like this in the Old Testament. Uh, it's really remarkable because of the 250 times that the word nephesh is translated soul in the Old Testament, it's hard to find even one example where soul is used in this sense, at least very clearly. So here's a couple of maybe examples of this. Uh, Genesis 35 uh, came about as her soul was departing, for she died. Uh, she named him Ben-Oni, uh, but his father called him Benjamin. Uh, so, you know, again, it's like when we read this, you know, our view is just kind of like this Ghostbusters, like, okay, her soul is just kind of, whoop, you know, coming out of her body. But another possible translation of that for Nefesh could just be her life was departing. It, it, it doesn't have to be this like soul separating out of her body. It's just be her life is leaving her. She's, she's dying. Um, here's an interesting one. Psalm 1610, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or the realm of the dead, nor will you allow your holy one to undergo decay. Um, this is, sounds like, okay, he's, it sounds like, okay, God is talking about not abandoning my soul to the, the realm of the dead, but but I'm still not 100% sure he's conceiving of the soul here as this thing that's just totally separate from the body. Uh, it's just so important to understand, in the Old Testament thinking, the body was not considered to be discarded, and then it was the soul that lived on eternally. No, the body would one day be resurrected too. In fact, it's very interesting that in Acts chapter 2, this is the very verse that Peter uses to argue for Jesus' bodily resurrection. He says, when God promised, I will not abandon Jesus' soul to Hades, he was saying, I'm going to raise your body from the grave. Because the soul here David's talking about is not just the immaterial part of himself, but the whole, his whole being, every part of himself, his, his body included. So it's rare in the Old Testament to hear the soul talk about that like that. But when you come to the New Testament, in fairness, it is more common to kind of have the soul talked about as something separate from the body. That is something more common in the New Testament. So you might have verses uh, like Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. <clears throat> um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, Paul says, may the God of peace sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord and Jesus Christ. <clears throat> My guess is the reason there's more language about the separation between soul and body in the New Testament is because the world Jesus entered into was so heavily influenced by Greek philosophy. They, <laughs> they were so influenced by this separation of the soul and the body that Jesus was just speaking in their language in, in a way that they would understand. Of course, he was speaking accurately about it because the thing is the Greeks did not speak accurately about it. They thought the soul is good, but the body is evil. And our goal is to escape these bodies and for our soul to one day you know, live on eternally, but to get out of these you know, evil, awful bodies. Now, my fear is that in America, that's what we believe. And sometimes in the church, I think that's what we believe. In fact, many of our songs reflect Greek philosophy. And I don't think it's necessarily sinful to sing those songs. I just think we need to be careful to realize what we're singing. Uh, a lot of our songs reflect Greek philosophy, that our souls are just going to leave our body and we're going to be living as souls in heaven disembodied. And that's not what Jesus taught at all. 
Jesus taught that our bodies would also be resurrected and transformed um, as well. And our souls and bodies are both important. Maybe another reason Jesus came to shed more light on the soul is because the Jews were way too physically minded, right? They had their, you know, everything was physical kingdom and geographical this and fleshly that. And Jesus, 2 Timothy 1.10 says he came to bring light, uh, immort- immortality uh, to light uh, through the gospel. He, he came to kind of shed light on, on some spiritual things that the Jews didn't really, you know, fully fully comprehend. Uh, Before we get to the spirit, though, any comments or questions about the soul so far on those three uses of the soul uh, that we talked about or anything that I just said before we get to the spirit? And as always, raise your hand. We'll get you a a microphone. My assumption is that it's just perfectly clear if you don't have any questions, but I I don't know if that's, or it's just so confusing you don't even know what to say. (laughs) All right, David's got one here. Very good. This is sort of a question. Is the soul the thing that God gives us when we take our first breath? Because we're going to live forever, and the thing that lives forever is the soul. Or have I got it all wrong? No, no, that's a very good question. Uh, so the soul and the spirit will live forever, but so will our bodies when our bodies are transformed. Uh, but the thing is, your question is very interestingly worded, and I'm going to answer it in a second. Uh, with a verse that I'm going to have on the screen. So hold that first question, Herb. So you knew this was inevitable. Maybe. This is going to go into (laughs) the new heavens and new earth. Oh, is it? I did not know that. Yeah, it's... Go ahead. Sure. You're knocking at the door because... I I wasn't knocking, but that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Go ahead. When you state that we... The church, many in the church believe that when we die, our soul will go to heaven. And Mm. um, I can confirm that that's, yes, that's true. Mm. So maybe this is a a separate question and a separate study for another quarter. I I think that it, if you have the time to kind of quickly address it, that'd be great. If you'd rather wait and do it as a separate study. Because I think most of us sitting here grew up hearing just what you said. And it is reflected in our songs. So that's going to be a, that's a shock to many of us. Yes. Because we think what we, well, unfortunately in the movies, they show these decayed bodies mm-hmm. and maybe even some pictures of, but so when we think of a body being raised from the dead, we're all going, whoa. Yeah, gross. <laughs> what is that going to look like? Yeah. So you see the struggle we're, struggle we're having here. Yeah, I do. And I mean, that's the exact struggle that the Corinthians had in 1 Corinthians 15. They, they said, well, with what body will they come then if, if we're going to be raised from the dead? And Paul's saying, no, you don't understand. Like, we're not going to be zombies, right? We're going to be transformed into these glorious, eternal, incorruptible bodies, is his point. But to speak uh, very briefly uh, to what you're saying about the new heavens and earth, I do believe this is our biggest hang-up on that teaching, is that we uh, have been... We're too heavily influenced by Greek philosophy. We think that material things are bad and evil and must all be destroyed. And the good things are the immaterial spiritual things that must live forever. And that is not the way that the Jewish Bible presents things. Um, That's not the way that the New Testament presents things either. The New Testament presents things as all things both material and immaterial were created as good, but they were tainted and corrupted by sin. And God's plan is to restore all things, to conquer sin by restoring all things, not just by, yes, he will destroy the evil parts of things, uh, but he will also uh, restore. So 
So even thinking of any concept of heaven that has any hint of anything that's material is it's very triggering for, for us. And that, that sounds very, very offensive to our ears. And so I'm sensitive to that fact. I just think we um, maybe just need to think about it like the Jews thought about it in the first century uh, Bible authors thought about it, and we won't be as offended by it. All right, I see you, Larry, but I think Debbie had it first. Go ahead, Debbie. Um, you know, when I looked it up, it, I, you know, I looked up about the Nafis, and you just said that, made reference to in Genesis 2 7, that God breathed into the body. That's the verse I'm about to put up on. There. Okay, yes. and we became a living <laughs> being, and then it said after death the nephes ceases to exist living lingering only in the living body so that that is kind of what you were saying that it's together the yeah. body and the spirit are together yes. and they're but then that leads us into then what happens when we die and yeah, where does I'm, all that, which is another question, I know. Right, yeah, I'm not sure about like the, the nephesh ceasing to exist part. But, but Genesis 2-7 is interesting because the, it's the spirit that gives life to the soul. And that's what we're going to, that will be your, the answer to David's question in a second. All right, Larry? Yeah, um, <clears throat> since uh, soul and spirit in the Old and New Testaments are kind of used interchangeably. It does get a little bit confusing. For sure. Uh, to say the least. And sure. it's, this is a subject that's actually interested me for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, I had even asked Bill Feist years ago to bring a lesson on it. Yeah. Um, he, he was smart to avoid it. <laughs> he did, and he was did a good job. He was smarter than I was. That's um, <laughs> but, uh, okay, so um, in James, the second chapter, in verse 26, it says, and this is where death, bodily death, is defined mm -hmm. by God. Mm -hmm. It says, because the body without the spirit is dead, sure. so faith without works is dead. So a physical human body without the spirit is dead. Yeah. So you're right. Uh, the spirit gives life. It's the it's the life force of who we are, but it it helps me to um, uh, go back and understand that God created us in His image. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? It means that He created us in His spiritual image. We have a soul and a spirit. We were created eternal spirit beings, and the soul, uh, from what I've studied in Scripture, is the apparatus of who we are, the, the part of us who we are that is the decision making. It's the personality. It's the it's the the farmer who said, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger barns. Uh, he made a decision and and God said, your soul will be required of you. Uh, the spirit, um, the way I understand it, is that part of us that gives us life. And it's the part of us that gives us, the, I think the Greek word is ethos, which is enthusiasm in English. It's, uh, it's the part that gives us the drive to continue the perseverance. So the, the soul is our person. It's who we are. It's the part of a human being that says, I will serve God or won't serve God. Mm -hmm. And it is certainly the part of us that will be judged. Yeah. 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 And, and I guess I will just, I will add this caveat that it is true we're made in God's image, and God is spirit. We have to remember that human beings are unique. I'm not sure what happened to my microphone, if it, you guys are hearing me okay. Um, it sounds weird to me. Uh, angels are spiritual beings, right? They were already spiritual beings. Humans are unique. We are created from the dust as well. We are spirit, but we are also body. We are also embodied spirit. We are made from the dust, and it was to us that God gave dominion, not the angels. Even Hebrews 2 talks about the world to come is not subject to angels, but to man, to, to son of man. So, so we just, again, we, I just want us to be careful not to downplay the fact that we are dust. We are from dust. We are created from the earth. We are earth dwellers. Uh, and that is part of the narrative of, of the Bible that makes us special. So anyway, yeah, I'm going ahead. Sorry. <clears throat> All right, so spirit. Uh, this is Ruach uh, in the Hebrew in the Old Testament, and this is Numa in the New Testament Greek. 
Also a huge study because of the number of times that it's used. And again, like you, many of you said, it's used synonymously a lot of times, kind of interchangeably, but I'll point out some kind of unique ways that it's used. First of all, uh, the word spirit, it means breath. And so it's the life force for our souls. So the soul is like uh, the, the alive self. So, so they're both similar. Soul and spirit both describe our, the self in some way. But spirit and soul are used to describe different aspects of the self. So the spirit is like the, the thing that gives the self its life. And this is what David was, was asking about earlier. Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath or spirit of life, and man became a living soul. All right, so it's, so it's the spirit that God breathes into us that gives life to our souls, that, that, that gives us that, that being, okay? Um, secondly, it's used to describe one's inner moral character. So you'll see phrases like this, if a spirit of jealousy comes over him. Um, that's used a lot of different times. Mood, so it's kind of like emotions, but maybe a little more like, you know, what mood you're in rather than like your, the longings that you have. Uh, so here's one with Ahab, but Jezebel, his wife came to him and said, how is it that your spirit is so sullen that you're not eating any food? Uh, so there, there's mood. Um, the center of our thoughts, our consciousness, our awareness. I misspelled awareness there. Uh, there's an e either. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.11. Who among men? Yeah, awareness. Uh, <laughs> who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Uh, there's a verse in Mark 2 somewhere, Mark 3, I think, where it, it says Jesus became aware in his spirit of the reasonings within them. Uh, so... Uh, as far as the internal, you know, immaterial part of ourselves that's separate from our bodies and, and all that, it's kind of similar with the soul. We're like, it's not really used that way much at all in the Old Testament, but it is used more that way in the New Testament, kind of like, you know, where Jesus is on the cross and it says, you know, he, he um, breathed his last and gave up his spirit. You know, so there, there's an example of that. Um, very similar. They both refer to the self. Here, here, I would say, if you could narrow it down to one core difference, it would be this, that the soul can be a reference to the whole person, you know, which could include the body and the spirit. But anytime you see spirit, it, it seems to always just be a reference to the, to the inner person, not, not really a reference to the body. So maybe that's a core difference, though you have those other differences as well that we talked about. And as we read earlier in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, however you want to delineate these things, Paul says that God is going to preserve complete our souls, our spirits, and our bodies at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's our hope. Any questions or comments about any of those differences before we get to our second question this morning? I know that's really deep, really heavy, lots of stuff. All right, Gail. What Herb said was true, that we have been raised to believe something a certain way. And so even at funerals, preachers of the gospel have said, um, you know, that their soul is with God now or things like that. But Which I've I think always... is true until the body is resurrected. <clears throat> okay, so that me... was my question okay. because you, if he's resurrecting the body but the soul's already with God, what would be the purpose of him resurrecting the body? Yeah. So I don't want to get too much on Dwayne. Dwayne that's Dwayne's Q&A on Wednesday. Uh, where, where do we go when we die? I don't want to get too much into that. But yeah, when Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise to the thief, right? yeah, your soul, when you die, yes, if you're righteous, your soul does go to be with God. But our bodies will be resurrected on the last day. John chapter 5, Jesus talks about that. Um, we'll all be resurrected together at the same time, at the end when he returns. Okay, but until then, yes, our souls will be, be with God. Uh, maybe I just saved you time, I don't know. <laughs> or you disagree with that, and now I'm really in trouble. All right, Jenna. <laughs> um, so this is sort of connected, and I don't know if this is one you want to hear either, but... Um, 
I've heard bodily resurrection used to say that um, cremation is wrong because, um, mm. you know, it's destroying the body. I was just curious what would be your take on that and how is that connected to this? Because I, I didn't realize it was a moral issue until I heard somebody talk about it that way and I was just kind of wondering. Yeah, I don't think it's wrong at all to be cremated uh, because if you think about it, what, is, what does David's body look like at this point in the grave? Cremated, right? It's dust, right? What if you die in a fire? Okay, I mean, yeah, the, the point is it doesn't matter what happens to your body in this life. God is going to resurrect it. Now, that's weird. How that happens, I don't know, right? Like, that's God. If he can create the universe, if he can, that, this is the imagery, right? If he can take us in Genesis 2 and form us from the dust in the first place, well, then if to dust we return when we die, Ecclesiastes 12, well, then when we're resurrected, he can take us right back out of the dust, right, and bring us back to life and, and, and transform, right, our, our bodies. So, and that's the whole imagery of when we become a Christian as well. He's breathing his Holy Spirit, his holy breath into us. We, we die spiritually because of sin. We become dust, but then God breathes his Holy Spirit into us. He raises us from the dead in the waters of baptism and then transforms us, right? And now the life we live, we're living for Christ as if we are already living in the new heavens and new earth, as if we're already walking in heaven. This is the idea of the Christian life. Uh, so when you understand the imagery of the soul and the spirit in Scripture, it just enriches your view of what it means to live as a Christian and, and God's plan for our lives. It's very grand. All right, Randy, and then... One more, and then we probably do have yeah, to move on. You could even do this at a later one if you want. Since we got on. No, it's very close. It's just it's just the mic heard. Of the of the body. Ah. I know you're doing good. The mic. It's just the mic. <laughs> okay. Uh, it says you know that the body will be resurrected, but I, I wonder about if a person say lost a limb through an accident or a disease will he be resurrected as an amputee because we know when christ was resurrected he had he told thomas put your hand into my side so apparently that part wasn't regenerated so i wasn't sure how that worked and again if you want to answer yeah. that later that's yeah that's a good question we don't know the answer to that that's a big debate about was that jesus was that really jesus's you know fully transformed body was his body more transformed when he, you know, when he resurrected or when he ascended to heaven? Was it transformed more fully? Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, okay, Connor, Brandon, I love you. I just don't know if I have time. That's the problem. And I'll try to be quick. Uh, it's easy to beat up on the Greeks. Like, oh, they're the first people to think that the body is separate from whatever um, eternal decision-making thing that inhabits us. Uh, but we do see in uh, 1 Samuel 27 that Saul gets a spiritist to summon Samuel, who was buried in a completely different part of Israel at the time. Mm -hmm. So obviously there's a spiritual aspect of you that would be recognizable if brought forth in the, in the proper manner um, that is completely separate from your physical body. And you see the same thing on the- Mount of Transfiguration. Mount of Transfiguration. Yeah. And then you also, there's, there's the parable about Lazarus and what happens to him. His body is decaying in the ground, but he, a recognizable part of him is rec you know, seen from across a, a void. Yes. And uh, and can be you know so yeah I'll very good yeah I'm picking on the Greeks mainly for believing that the body is evil and bad and that we need to escape it uh, but certainly the the Jews had a concept of a soul separate from the body yeah Brandon go ahead to follow up with Randy I would think God is able to have us be whatever version of our physical body He wants us to be whether it's with the missing limb still or completely restored to our best version of ourselves as healthy as we could possibly be mm. and to say that he could only do one or the other would be a limitation yeah i mean look it opens up so many questions right like if a four-year-old dies and goes to heaven it, are they four years old for all eternity and if they grow up how 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 long do they grow up right like how old do we get in heaven right because <laughs> we know there's not going to be any pain and then you, if you get a certain age like usually there's growing pains with that and so you have you know, million-year-old people, what do they look like in heaven? Like, I don't know, you know, so there are, unfortunately, a lot of unanswered questions like that. But, yeah, it's good to think about, but, unfortunately, those are Deuteronomy 29, 29. That's my favorite Q&A uh, verse, all right? The secret things belong to the Lord. 
right? But the things that we need, right, he's given those to us. So that's always if I need to get out of something, an emergency, that's my emergency. <laughs> Pull the ripcord, you know, Deuteronomy 29, 29. He even made it simple for us with the verse. Well, the verses were added later, but anyway. <laughs> All right. Uh, who wrote the books of history in the Old Testament? Uh, these would be Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles. Uh, of course, those are split up in our in our Bibles. In the Jewish Bibles, they were more combined. They weren't First and Second. It was just, it was just Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, and Judges and Ruth were combined in one one book uh, as well. Uh, well, the short answer is we don't know for sure because there aren't any official statements of authorship in any of these books. Uh, the closest thing you know, we might have to a statement of authorship uh, would be Joshua 24, 26. Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. But the question is, when it says Joshua wrote these words, what words is he talking about? And I don't think he's talking about the words of the book of Joshua. I think he's talking about the words in the immediate context, which was the covenant they just made with him at Shechem, where they just said, you know, all the things that the Lord says, like, we will do, you know, we will obey him. So I don't think you could use this verse and, and prove and say, oh, well, that means Joshua wrote the entire book of Joshua. Maybe you could say Joshua wrote Joshua 23, uh, but not the whole book. Now, we do have a collection of oral traditions from the Jews called the Talmud, uh, it's filled with teachings on Jewish philosophy and ethics and customs and history, commentary on Jewish law codes, which they claim is oral tradition that goes all the way back, you know, to Mount Sinai, you know, the very beginning, and have been passed down from generation to generation. And in one of the writings called the Bava Batra, which means the last gate, one of the rabbis goes down the list and actually gives the names of the authors of the historical books. So here's a section from Bava Batra 14b to 15a, uh, and I edited it a little bit just because it's much longer, but I, I kind of cut out the parts that weren't pertinent to what we're talking about. But anyway, he says, who wrote the books of the Bible? Moses wrote his own book, i.e. the Torah and the portion of Balaam in the Torah and the book of Job. Uh, Joshua wrote his own book and eight verses in the Torah, which described the death of Moses. Samuel wrote his own book, the book of Judges, and the book of Ruth. Jeremiah wrote his own book and the book of Kings and Lamentations. Ezra wrote his own book and the genealogy of the book of Chronicles until his period. And who completed the book of Chronicles for the generations following Ezra? Well, that was Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Uh, so here's the basic chart of authorship according to the Jewish Talmud. You've got Joshua wrote Joshua, Samuel wrote Judges, Ruth, first and second Samuel, Jeremiah wrote first and second Kings, Ezra and Nehemiah wrote first and second Chronicles. Now, that is just Jewish tradition. Now, I, I mean, I don't see any reason why that's not accurate, right? Why we should just say, well, they're just, that's false. They just made that up. I mean, I think there's probably a pretty good reason to, to take that pretty seriously. Uh, but again, you, it's not like ironclad proof because, again, none of the books have like a definite statement of like, my name is Joshua and I wrote this entire book. Like, it just doesn't say that, Okay. I do think it is important for us to grasp an important principle about the Old Testament books in particular. New Testament was different. But with the Old Testament books, most of them were written by primary authors, but then were shaped and organized into their final form by multiple authors over time. So, for instance, let's use Moses as an example of how this would work. There are several places where Moses is just clearly told, you know, to write things down. He's the author. Um, Exodus 17, 14, the Lord said to Moses, write this in a book as a memorial, recite it to Joshua that I'll utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So he's told, you remember when Amalek, you know, ambushed you on the way out of Egypt? I want you to write that down. Then later in Exodus 24, he's told, I want you to write down all the laws in these covenants. And, you know, you, you pass those down. In Numbers 33, Moses recorded their starting places according to their journeys by the command of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their, their starting places. So we have clear markers all throughout the first five books. Uh, well, maybe not as much in Genesis, but... Uh, some clear markers, right, that Moses wrote these things, okay, um, and then when you get to the New Testament, Jesus, he, Jesus assigns authorship of Exodus to Moses. He seems to assign authorship of Leviticus to Moses. The Pharisees, 
they seem to assign authorship of Deuteronomy to Moses. So I think it's safe to call Moses the primary author of the first five books of the Old Testament. In fact, the, the Jews called the first five books the, the Law of Moses. However, there are also very clear verses in these books that would have been details added later after the death of Moses that would not have been written by Moses. Okay, so a bunch of these, just give you a few examples. Genesis 12, 6. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moray. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. That implies that the time the author wrote this part, the Canaanites were not in the land anymore, which would have been written after Moses' death. Or, at the very least, Moses could have written this, but then you have a, a later author come in and add this note at the time that Genesis is being finalized, that the final form of Genesis is being put together. Uh, here's the famous one, Numbers 12, 3, in a parenthetical note. Now the man, Moses, was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. It would be a little odd if Moses wrote that. <laughs> okay. In fact, that's a self-defeating uh, statement. If you write that about yourself, now you're, you just ruin your whole point. You're not the most humble man on the earth. And I think if you're alive at the time and you know somebody's putting that in your book, like, and you let them, like, you're also not the most humble man. So probably Moses is not, was not around right, when somebody put that, that in. And then, of course, Deuteronomy, the whole last chapter, 34, it's about Moses' death. Moses' servant of the Lord died there. It, it, then it goes on to talk about how the people then followed Joshua, and they obeyed Joshua just like they obeyed Moses. And it's like the author has knowledge about all that happened after, long after the death of, of Moses. Okay, so again, Moses was a primary author, but his five books didn't reach their final form until many years afterwards. And we find the same kind of details in the books of history. So, for instance, let's say we take the traditional you know, Jewish Talmud, Samuel is the author of Judges. Well, Samuel died around 1000 B.C., but you have this note in Judges 18.30. The sons of Dan set up for themselves the graven image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. This takes the text all the way to 722 B.C. when they're taken captive by Assyria. That's 300 years after Samuel died. So there's no way that Samuel wrote that line. Now, I suppose somebody could say, and people have tried this, well, if he's inspired by God's Spirit, then he could have been speaking, you know, prophetically, you know, Moses could have been speaking prophetically even about his death. You know, that would have been weird, right? And Moses died. What? You know, <laughs> what'd you say, God? <laughs> Moses couldn't get into the Canaan line. What? <laughs> like, that's not, I don't like the way this story is going. It's just, it's just not, I understand why people will say that because this, this whole conversation makes people nervous. It makes them feel like God's word is not inspired or something like that. But it, it's just not fair to how the Jews handled the text. And there's whole studies that go way in depth on all this stuff. It's just well known that this is how the Jews handled these inspired texts. And the question, of course, is, well, who, who put them together, right? Who's helping this process? Well, it would have been the Levitical scribes and those in the school of the prophets. There was a line of prophets. Sometimes they were called the sons of the prophets. And it seems like they, it was like a school, and they had like a system of apprenticeship and training that was set up somehow. And they viewed it as their role to compile and, and preserve uh, and to kind of organize and, and put God's word into, into its final form. And, I mean, let's be honest, when we think about Old Testament prophets, when I say that word, almost all of us, we just think about the major players. We just think, oh, that's Isaiah, that's Jeremiah, that's, that's Samuel. Yeah, Old Testament prophets, I got it. But there were thousands of prophets throughout the generations of Israel's history. And you have little notes like this, 1 first, first Samuel 19, 20, then Saul sent messengers to take David. But when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying with Samuel standing and presiding over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. So you, you have this school of prophets with Samuel kind of being in charge of them in some way. You see this same concept uh, with uh, Elijah and Elisha, 
you read about Jezebel killing many prophets of the Lord, but Obadiah, he, he actually saved a hundred prophets of the Lord. Uh, here's 2 Kings 2, 7, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite of Elijah uh, and Elisha there. Uh, here, here's a good tag team scribe and prophet duo, uh, Jeremiah 36, 4. Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken to him. So while we may not know the exact authors, uh, and, and there may have been multiple authors contributing to the final form of the Old Testament, we can still trust that God was working in this process through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, through inspired prophets, through the Levites, right, who were a holy tribe set apart to help uh, with this process. And at the end of the day, I would say it's a comfort to know that Jesus himself recognized the books of history as the inspired word of God. He said in Luke 24, 44, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He's referring here to the common three-part structure of the Old Testament. The Torah, the prophets, otherwise known as the Nevi'im, and the Psalms, or the Ketuvim. Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings were considered part of the prophets. And Ruth and Chronicles were considered part of the Psalms. And he believed all the books of history were part of God's inspired word. And since he resurrected from the grave, and he's God's son, I think that's all the proof we need to know <laughs> that those are indeed God's, God's inspired word. All right, any comments or questions? If so, you only have a minute, but go ahead, make the most of it. <laughs> Unless you're going to tie it into the new heavens and earth, and I'm not going to work. <laughs> you can do it. Nobody wants to be that kid at the end of class, you know. <laughs> Get beat up after class, making us go over. <laughs> Still 40 seconds, I mean, come on. <clears throat> well, okay, well, I guess I'll just make the last comment and say there are, of course, liberal scholars who don't believe in God and the inspiration of Scripture who will start talking about this multiple authorship stuff, and they'll try to use it to discredit Scripture. And um, we need to, again, with all things, we need to be careful not to be reactionary and swing in the opposite direction, right? We need to not be afraid to talk about the fact that there might be multiple authors contributing to the final product just because a lot of liberal scholars are talking about that to disprove inspiration. Because if we swing the other way and we say, oh, no, there's just one author of each book, then we end up kind of making ourselves look foolish in, in the process. Uh, and that's not, that's not good either. So I hope that's helpful. really appreciate it. And Dwayne will answer the rest of the questions on Wednesday night, Lord willing.